Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do, you, why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is written, The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from the on high. The second reading is from Acts, chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 13. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one, heard, each one of them heard speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it each of us hears him in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Thank you very much. It is Pentecost Sunday this Sunday. What I'm going to do, here's how the service is going to work. I'm going to preach a little sermon now, yeah? Just about the history of it, what it's about, what actually happened. But the important thing is that, yep, sure, it's a historical event that happened 2,000 years ago. But it wasn't a one-off. It was the beginning of something, okay? So it's a bit like saying if you had a a, a West End theatre production, it's like that was the first night, but from that point on, it became like Agatha Christie's mouse trap, And it's run forever since. So when I've brought this little word to you, just so we can get Pentecost firmly implanted in our minds and the idea of the Holy Spirit being with us, then we're going to worship the Lord in the Spirit with a couple of more songs. And then we're going to pray together in the Spirit, together. All right? Um, don't be alarmed. <laughs> it's fine. So first of all, Pentecost. It happened 50 days after the Passover, okay? And it's already a date that was significant if you were Jewish. It's a a date that was celebrated back in the Old Testament, and traditionally it would be the time when the Jewish Jews celebrated together when Moses brought the Ten Commandments, the law, the word of God to the people. It's called the Festival of Weeks. It's also, if you like, called Harvest Festival. We have Harvest Festival in September, but in the Jewish calendar they would kind of have it Pentecost. But it was more about the harvest of the word, the law that had been given to them. That's what they were celebrating. 
So it's really interesting, isn't it, that God himself had chosen that particular festival day as the day when he would pour out his spirit on all mankind. If you like, the ultimate harvest festival, a harvest of souls. He would begin that harvest. And I know I've just mentioned that event, Spring Harvest, which has been running for years and years and years in Butlin's holiday camps. That's kind of what that's alluding to as well. A harvest in the springtime, a harvest of souls, of people. That's what we're really interested in this morning. So when you, con- when you think about it, you've got the Passover, that's during Holy Week, that's Maundy Thursday, Jesus celebrates his last Passover with his friends. Then you've got the crucifixion on Good Friday, you've got Easter Sunday, the following Sunday. And then after that, well, from Easter Sunday onwards, Jesus starts popping up the resurrected, risen Jesus all over the place. There are 11 separate resurrection appearances mentioned in the Bible. And they're not all in the Gospels. Some of them are in the letters too. The, most, the, the greatest amount of people that Jesus appeared to at one time was over 500. And the fewest people that Jesus appeared to was one, which he did on several occasions. Okay? So you've got that, that period of 40 days when Jesus kept appearing. And then he takes them up the mountain, ascends into heaven, and he gives them that instruction that Rosalind read to us from the gospel there. Wait in the city. Don't go anywhere. Wait in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. That's how he puts it. And at that point, they wouldn't have had any idea what he was on about. They would have thought, right, Jesus says things that make no sense. And then after a while, we realize that they do make sense, like, you know, Three days I'll be gone, then I'll be back. What does this one mean? Clothed with power from on high. Could be anything, couldn't it? Uh, Scary. So they're kind of waiting for it because they don't really understand what the Holy Spirit is at that point. You see, it hasn't been poured out. Fortunately, and this is the bit I'm really trying to get over to you, they don't have long to wait because it's already 40 days since Easter, effectively. They've only got to wait another 10 days for the day of Pentecost. But it must have been an interesting 10 days. I mean, imagine if you were living with that promise and thinking, well, he didn't say when it's going to happen. Is it going to happen tomorrow? Is it going to happen next week, next month, next year? We've got to wait in Jerusalem, have we? What, for a year, for two years? Who knows, for five years? How long until we are clothed with power from on high? And what does that mean anyway? Does it mean he's coming back, which he did tell us he was. Perhaps that's the end of all things. Perhaps it's tomorrow then. Who knows when it is? Perhaps it, it won't be long. Who knows? And they didn't. Imagine if we're waiting for something like that, that you don't really know what's going to happen. Even for 10 days, you'd be, so, you'd be on edge, wouldn't you? Oh, is it today? Is it? When's it going to happen? And then it finally happens on the day of Pentecost. Now, I bet they all went, oh, we should have known he'd pick today. Yeah, significant day. And of course, it was a massively significant day because you've got all these Jewish people from all different countries who've come into town on that day because it's a festival. And that's why they've got all these different languages. Can I, can I just ask, I'm not going to embarrass you, but is anybody visiting us who's on holiday this, this morning? Sometimes we get one or two. Hello. Well, we've seen you before, haven't we? we remind me of where you live, though. Wiltshire, it's nice to have you with us again. Yeah, Nice to see your arm up in worship as well, by the way. We need more of that, you see? People come, they visit us, and they show us the way, often, yeah? Okay, super. Sometimes we have quite a few tourists. Ironic that we shouldn't have this weekend when I'm talking about it, isn't it? But there you go, on the Whitson weekend. But there are plenty of them about. At a time when lots of people came into the city, that was the time when Jesus poured, uh, yeah, Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit. On, on people so they could go and witness to them. And it does strike me that living where we do, in such a big kind of holiday area, we do have a unique opportunity every summer to talk to tourists wherever we can. I mean, Eskel's Methodist Church has made a ministry of it, haven't they? Because they sort of have quite low numbers during the winter, but then in the summer it all goes mad and they're all packed out, you see? You know, given where they are near Sennan Beach. So, the Holy Spirit is poured out on not just the apostles. I have a feeling it's a bigger group of people than just those 12 apostles because they've reappointed a new one to replace Judas. 
I think it's the wider church. The people who are talked about in the previous chapter, they're a bigger group of people, male and female. They are the Christians. They're not known as Christians yet. They're the people who believe Jesus. Many of them have met him face to face in resurrection appearances and they're just there waiting. Where are they waiting? Are they in the upper room that they were in? Probably not, actually, because they were out and about a lot and they would probably be, I imagine, at the temple. They used to go to the temple every day and hang out in the temple courts. So it may have been an, a kind of an outdoor sort of scenario. I'm not, I'm not even sure. Or they may have been indoors. The fact is, it happened. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit descends on them. And the first thing that in, it enables them to do is to speak languages which they do not know, which they have not learned at school if they indeed have been to school. And the reason for that is so that they can go and mix and mingle in the crowd of people from all different countries, many of which we heard mentioned there, and they could speak in those people's own languages. It's the gift of tongues. And you hear me talking about the gift of tongues and other spiritual gifts quite a lot. The gift of tongues, I do believe, is something that Whilst it's not given to everybody, it's given to more of us than we would give credit to. And often it's for your personal use. In the autumn, my friends, here at Chapel Street, we are planning to do an Alpha course, which will be a major feature of our church calendar. And if you've done an Alpha course before, and if you haven't, you should definitely come to it. And even if you have, it's great to come on it again, just as a, like a reminder of it. But it talks about the gift of tongues there quite a lot, as being... God's love language, the language that he gives you so that you can worship him. Yeah. So it's something that probably will never be heard by other people. But when you're on your own or when you're in a crowd of people who are praying, you can you can pray in tongues without making a big fuss about it. And it enables you really to commune via the Holy Spirit with God. It's a language which you don't even recognize, but it leads you into the throne room of God. Now, it's probably very different, therefore, from the gift of tongues as we saw at Pentecost, where I have a good idea that when the disciples started talking to people from different places, different countries, I imagine they knew what they were saying, yeah? Whereas often with the Holy Spirit, he will give you a language where you don't know what you're saying, but he does. It's quite an interesting one. But we sort of have this reservation, almost this fear about using it, and we really shouldn't. Because it doesn't have to be as weird as often it's portrayed to be. If you hear somebody speaking a different language that you don't understand, then that's a tongue. It's a tongue that you're not aware of. But it's something that we can use to praise God with, to pray. Now this Holy Spirit, once poured out, it becomes freely available to all of us. And that means that whoever we are, wherever we are, and I'm not just talking about speaking in funny languages now, I'm talking about all those other gifts of the Spirit. We've got the power of God in our lives to help us get through each day, to take us on through this journey of life. And to remember what some of those other gifts are. Some of them are like really obvious, like the gift of helping others. As Christians, even if before we were a Christian, we weren't that particularly interested in anybody else anyway, if we were particularly selfish by nature, when the Holy Spirit comes... He can give us that gift of helping others or a gift of compassion where suddenly we start to care about people and we never have before. That's revolutionary in some of our lives. You think, my goodness, I didn't care before about if anyone lived or died. But now I really want to help people. The gift of helping others. There's the gift of mercy, which is like compassion. Caring about somebody even though you don't have to. Helping somebody out, trying to improve the lives of others around you. Why? Is it because you're a superhuman being? No, it's simply because the Holy Spirit is now a part of your life. It's a a, a main criticism that people give, isn't it? People who aren't Christians. My granddad, my grandpa as I called him actually, who was a devout atheist. And when he saw me getting interested in Christianity as a teenager, he he would say, oh, Christians, they're just a bunch of do-gooders, yeah? Yeah? You know, they're just trying to show off, trying to, trying to appear to be upright, you know, trying to appear to, oh, these Christians, oh, so, oh, they're all so holy, aren't they? And we've established many times during my time here at Chapel Street, we don't think we're holy, none of us. We all know that in many ways we get things wrong. We're sinners. We've screwed up over and over again. 
And as much as we try to make our own lives better and we've tried to be perfect and tried to be the sort of people that other people like and that we like ourselves, it often doesn't work out. We really need the Holy Spirit in our lives to help us get through every day. Some of us lack confidence. But God's Holy Spirit gives us supreme confidence because we're not walking anymore in our strength. We're walking in his strength. That's the Holy Spirit in action every day, today. And do you know the clearest way that I've, I think I've seen it portrayed, a really simple, really helpful way, is not in some big theological book that I've read, though I have read quite a few big theological books about this subject, but when our children were tiny, we bought them a children's Bible called the Beginner's Bible. Have you ever come across it? It's a wonderful thing. There's probably a copy lying around here somewhere. All right? And it's, it's meant for the under fives, for preschool age children. There's a lot of lovely colourful pictures in and there's very easy text which you can read to them. They could subsequently learn to read themselves. And most of the big Bible stories, Old Testament and New Testament, are in the beginner's Bible. It's the size of a Bible. And when it gets to this bit about Pentecost, it said, you know, the Holy Spirit descends on everybody like tongues of fire. And then it goes with them from that point. And the picture on that final kind of page uh, shows all the disciples walking along like this with big smiles on their faces. And above them, in a kind of a, a speech bubble, there's a picture of Jesus smiling away as well. Everywhere they go, everywhere they went, they took Jesus with them by the Holy Spirit. And I thought, that is bang on. But not just as a memory, oh, I remember Jesus. But as a, as, I was going to say a physical presence, but it's a spiritual presence. So he's with them all the way. Everywhere you go, he goes with you. He can only do that via his Holy Spirit. He can only walk with every single one of us, because we're all going in different directions at one time. Everybody around the world, if he's here with us in spirit. So today is the church's birthday, if you like. The time when the Spirit came to everybody and started walking with everybody from that point on.